Hey, you may notice that much like last week, we're not in my room this week. At least I hope you noticed. I kind of thought you were getting kind of tired of that one, so I figured I'd show you something more interesting. For one, it snowed. It snowed a lot. I was actually thinking about uh, hurling a snowball at the webcam as a sort of introduction, which sounded like a good idea right up until the point where I would have to buy a new webcam, so that one was out. So instead, I present to you my backyard and, oh, there's a very good start. That'd be my dog. Bobby! Bobby! Bobby, Bobby! Let's lose Digga! Very distracted dog. Oh. I don't know what he's doing. He's 15 years old, so he doesn't hear that well anymore. Or does anything well anymore for that matter. Uh, what else interesting things do we have? Oh, 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 yes. So as you may be noticing, I don't live in the city. Precisely. That would be uh, chickens, probably very hungry. There's some ducks too, but I have no idea where they wandered off to. Then, yeah, we have trees. And that's a really funny sign, but it will only make sense if you speak German. And... Yes, there's a face on that tree. Other than that, um... This week I have prepared a little healing guide on Ice Count Citadel with healing tips and uh, some general fight tips and... Well, for the first seven bosses, as far as has been released. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Lord Maragar isn't a particularly healing intensive fight, and when executed correctly, is mainly reliant on people moving out of fires and switching over to kill spines fast. However, especially when your raid members tend to be on the slow side, there's some spike damage that you have to be prepared to deal with. To this encounter, we take six healers. Two tank healers, a disc priest, and three raid healers. Disc priests make very effective raid healers for this fight. They can quickly bubble any slow poke standing in fire as spike people, as well as pre-bubble the raid when bone storm is coming up to greatly reduce the damage taken. Prayer of Mending should also be kept up on this fight. Penance is best used on helping out with tank damage unless you have an emergency, like someone getting spined in a fire. Holy Priests will probably find themselves helping out with the tank healing quite a bit, but it's a good idea to switch targets for cold flame and impale damage. Definitely make sure you have palm balancing during Bone Storm and heal everyone in rage with your AoE tools. COH, POH, and even Renew come to mind. A Shaman. Chain heal is your best bet in this fight. Instants are best safe for tank dipping low or the smart people that are incredibly attracted to shiny blue flames. For paladins, this is a cookie cutter beacon fight and druids benefit mostly from hotting everyone in range as usual. Swiftment is very handy for this fight too. Death Whisper requires quick reaction time from healers. We also usually take 6 healers to this. In the first phase, tank healing shouldn't be particularly intense unless you're going for achievements or get unlucky with fanatics, but you do have raid damage incoming from various sources. For one, Death Whisper's continuous shadow bolts and death and decay will always have random targets. Past that, mind-controlled raid members can quickly burst down another raid member, so make sure to watch out for that. Disc bubbles and any instant heal are very useful for mind control bursts. Also keep an eye on casters that don't catch on to adhere and spell reflect too quickly. This phase favors reactive healing as opposed to preemptive healing like Maragar, so unless you're assigned to tank healing, make sure you're on the ball to heal whoever takes damage. Priests, don't forget to keep prey of mending up. In phase 2, whoever is tanking Death Whisper at the time will need some supervision. 
The fast spell she casts should be interrupted, but you can't always rely on your rogues, so be prepared to heal a big damage spike every once in a while. The AoE Frostbolt she throws out should hit the entire raid for about half health, but are easily healed back up. Disc Bubbles, Preemptive Rejuice, Chain Heal, and 3 Stack Serendipity POH are nice here. Make sure to watch out for the ghosts that spawn and who they follow. A raid member getting hit by one when the AoE Frostbolts are coming up is usually bad news. The gunship battle is very, very easy on healers, unless your guild is still figuring out the mechanics. And if you're still figuring out the mechanics, it's unlikely you'll beat this fight. As long as the adds die in a timely manner, there isn't much damage going out. You kinda want to watch out for sergeants as they have a mortal strike ability and use Blightstorm. Not the damage of that goes up the longer they are alive, but as long as your guild has a working strategy for this fight, you shouldn't have any trouble healing this. For Deathbringer Sourfang, we also bring 6 healers. This fight starts out incredibly easy to heal. Tank damage starts out moderate, so you should have at least 2 dedicated tank healers for this encounter. Provided your raid is spread out accordingly, the only raid damage you'll have to worry about for a while is Boiling Blood, a damage over time spell that's placed on 3 raid members at the same time, and Blood Nova, which should ideally only hit 1 player for about 13k health. As the fight progresses, your tanks will take a lot more damage, so another healer should probably be switching over to full-time tank healing. If you have trouble with mark healing, assign specific healers to them ahead of time. Druids as well as priests make good mark healers. You probably want to keep your pallies on the tanks for this or place beacon on a mark. Once Sour Fang hits 25% health, he'll use an ability called Frenzy that increases his attack speed by 30%, ultimately speeding up his black power gain, which also results in more tank damage taken on top of the Frenzy and more marks. This is an excellent time to bloodlust to drop Sour Fang before your healers get overwhelmed by healing mark and tank damage. Faster got is ICC's first big healing test. We bring 6 healers to this also because of the Titan Rage Timer, but this one keeps you on your toes. Tank damage is fairly atrocious in this encounter, so we used 2 Holy Paladins as tank healers, and also had them be our Spore Anchors so they didn't have to move and stop healing, which could have resulted in a tank death and wipe. Raid healers will also be faced with a challenge though. Absolutely make sure that your raid is 8 yards apart so you don't stack puking damage on top of the constant raid damage, especially when Festergat hasn't consumed any clouds yet. As raid damage declines, tank damage increases with every cloud Festergat consumes up to 90% increased damage in the attack speed buff, so make sure to assign healers to help out with tank healing as appropriate and attempt to keep your tank healer's movement minimized. As with any consistent raid damage fight, Rejuve, Wild Growth, Chain Heal, Prayer of Mending, Renew, COH, Power Witch Shield, and Prayer of Healing Shine. Preemptive raid and tank healing while minimizing movement yet executing the strategy are key to this fight. Rot Face is not a particularly healing intensive fight if executed correctly. Sixilla should do fine. Having one competent disease cleanse is also recommended. You'll be faced with low to moderate tank damage, some varying damage from slime spray depending on your raid's awareness, and the most menacing damage you're faced with is mutated infection which takes for 4000 every second until it runs out or is dispelled. It's a good idea to assign a healer to mutated infection targets especially as the frequency of the injection speeds up. As long as slimes aren't on the loose and people get away from unstable ooze explosion, that's basically all the damage you'll be faced with in this encounter. Your off-tank's healer will need to remember to stay in his range at all times. Druids make excellent kiting healers. As long as you have the diseases covered, healing is easy. Again, we bring 6 healers to Pewter side, mainly based on the fact that at least for a couple weeks we're likely to do this fight with 3 tanks and need to maximize our DPS in phase 3 before the debuff stacks too high. A lot of damage in this fight is avoidable if your raid does its job right, so until phase 3 you should have a relatively easy time healing with the only damage being taken from freshly spawned slime puddles, slimes reaching their target and cookie cutter tank damage, and a light dot. 
Any other damage can and should be avoided, but be ready to deal with people getting hit by bombs and malleable goo, cause it'll happen. Two tank healers at most will be sufficient for the first two phases. We found a disc priest on raid healing to be incredibly useful in this encounter to better handle people with predictable incoming damage spikes, such as the one standing right below a malleable goo about to hit them. If you're still learning this fight, your holy priest might want to pick up body and soul to help slower raid members run from gas clouds. In phase 3, you will want an additional tank healer, maybe have your disc priest switch over, since putricide gains a substantial damage buff, and also the longer the phase lasts, the more damage the raid takes. At the end of the phase is the best time for a shit button such as Divine Hymn and Tranquility, as the dot is going to grow big. A quick boss burn is of utmost importance and if no one takes malleable goo or bomb hits on top of the dot, the damage is healable by 3 rate healers. Make sure people don't stray out of area healing range though, stragglers will die. <laughs>